almost a decade ago, investigators started a trial of bendamustine plus rituximab versus CHOP plus rituximab as first-line treatment for patients with indolent and mantle cell lymphomas. Bendamustine plus rituximab seemed to be the preferred first-line treatment approach uh, compared to RCHOP, and we now have some nine-year results to talk about. To do that, I'm with Dr. Matthias Rummel, who is an MD and a PhD, who's head of hematology at the clinic uh, for hematology and medical oncology at the Justice Liebig University Hospital in Gießen, Germany. Now, the paper I was talking about was uh, published in The Lancet in 2013, and you were the first author of that paper. So let's start there. What, what did we learn at that point regarding these combinations? So this trial was reported after a median follow-up of nearly four, four and a half years. At that moment, you are only looking for the progression-free survival because that was the primary objective. And it's always a debate if the progression-free survival is a perfect endpoint, and we really would like to see also the overall survival. But after four years in such a disease, which is rather an indolent disease, the overall survival will not be mature yet. So it's very important to have a long follow-up of such a trial. And even if it was ever planned as a prospective randomized trial, it even has a more important role to have a long follow-up to see in a controlled way how long and how good are the patients living. So in the Lancet, we reported the PFS, and uh, the conclusion was that bendamustine rituximab was superior to CHOP-R, and therefore it was being um, accepted as a so-called preferred standard treatment. Also, the NCCN guidelines has listed the bendamustine rituximab as a preferred first-line treatment for patients with this disease. Now, in terms of here at ASCO, we're at nine years of data, correct? What have we learned now? So, there was, of course, a long discussion over the five years. What is the long-term complication um, role of bendamustine rituximab? Are there any increased secondary malignancies? Will the patients die of late opportunistic infections? Uh, and all these questions. Because still many people say job r has a very good evidence because we know it for 30 years and we know what we have with job r and therefore we need really to see long-term results. So here I presented even a 10-year update so the median observation period is 117 months, so 10 year long. And we have reported um, the overall survival and the time to next treatment and the incidence of secondary malignancies. For that, we asked our study sites three main questions. What is the time to next treatment? Have the patients ever had a second line treatment? Second, is the patient alive or has he died? and when, for what reason, and third, was there any history of a secondary malignancy? So we decided to just ask these three questions because, as you may remember, that's an investigator-initiated trial. We should not overstress the doctors. If we ask complicated questions, they just simply will not answer. Right. But when they find three simple questions and they can make a tick box, yes or no, they will do it. Therefore, we have got very reliable long-term data of all our doctors. And um, also, I have to explain why we asked for time to second-line treatment. Why not for an update of progression-free survival? The problem is, a patient who is in ongoing response for seven years, eight years, nine years, he will not go anymore to a CT scan to show the evidence of progression-free or not. He just feels, I'm healthy, I'm good, I have still an ongoing response. I don't care for all these controls. I have done it until the study was closed right. for the progression-free survival. So therefore, we found a very nice correlation between progression-free survival and time to next treatment in our analysis in 2013. That gave us the confidence to also ask for time to next treatment as a surrogate parameter for the progression-free survival, which is a disease control. So two important messages now from the 10-year update, the long-term overall survival and the long-term time to second anti-lymphoma treatment. Time to next treatment was by far better for BR, again confirming our results published in The Lancet 2013. 
So there were 77 patients needed a second line treatment after being treated initially with BR compared to 109 after chop R. And also the curve, the survival curve for time to next treatment is much longer. So after 10 years, even more than 50% of the patients initially treated with BR did not have a second line treatment. While 50% of the patients after CHOPA had a second line treatment after a median of nearly five years. And um, this is highly statistically significant in favor of BR. And then we report the incidence of secondary malignancy because that is always debated. And you remember I told you we have asked that particular exactly. question. So we have, as I believe, good reliable data. If we have missed something because doctors would not answer, we missed it in both arms. So I feel this is a true result. And we found no difference in the incidence of secondary malignancies. So it was 37 patients with a secondary malignancies after BR and 40 after CHOP-R. So it's the same. There's no increased risk according to our data after bendamustine rituximab for developing a secondary malignancy. And then, and that is very unique, we show mature overall survival data. Very good, because we always discuss with our patients in debates what is the overall survival expectancy. And then there will be some sentences cited out of the textbooks, the median overall survival is 12 years, 10 years, and these are all, all data because no new study has addressed that question. In our study, at 10 years, 70% of patients are alive when they have been treated with BR, compared to 66% patients alive after CHOP-R. So the curve with Bendamustin, the overall survival curve, is a little bit above CHOP-R, but of course, there's absolutely no statistically significant difference because this difference is too small. Right. In, in terms of CHOP-R, is that now a historic regimen or is there still a place for it? I would say there's still a place for it and it comes back to the question, what is the maintenance with rituximab adding to that kind of regimen? Because to remember, our study was done without any maintenance. Six times BR against six times CHOP-R, no maintenance. And nowadays it's being discussed, we can extrapolate the results from Prima trial to every chemo. Right. I don't think that is the right extrapolation. We have to wait for the data if maintenance works after BR. So um, therefore your question is chop R now out? C cannot be answered like that because many doctors do it according to the Prima trial, chop R plus maintenance. I would say on the other side, BR plus maintenance is not necessarily better than BR without maintenance because we don't know the data yet. There will be out maybe in ASH or next year when we, have, uh, when we can report our next study results. So um, Brett Karl has made the interpretation of my oral presentation in ASCO, it's always like this, that after three abstracts, somebody goes on the stage, and he was making this conclusion. And he said, BR is the standard. I'm happy also if somebody decides chop R plus R maintenance. So this was his philosophical answer. So again, yes, he would say there is a standard, but he also says, yes, you can also do chop R as a standard if you think that is a treatment. I don't see from my perspective any reason to use CHOP-R to conclude with my personal belief after that results. Time to next treatment is better, no increased secondary malignancies, the same overall survival, less acute toxicity, and I hear it around the world from my colleagues that Bendamustin rituximab is good tolerated by the elderly patients. Well, it's, it's really good news. I mean, it's very encouraging that after 10 years, those are the results that you see. So in terms of what you do in, ter in adding some of the new agents to bendamustine, rituximab, do you think there's a need for that or a use for that? Of course, that um, overall survival can be and must be improved. We must find something. 
it's not a good story to say 70% are alive. I would like to say 85% are alive. We have not forget that the age of these patients is 62 years old. So some of these patients already will die due to their age and their other diseases. So I have looked for the overall survival curve of a healthy population. And of course, when you start with 62, not everybody is alive after 10 years. So also there's a death rate of 8 to 10%. So we are here at 70%. We have to improve this overall survival. However, it's not always so easy to just add a new compound. Many attempts were done and you see an increased toxicity. You must find a compound which really has very targeted and selected a mechanism of action against this kind of disease. And on the other side is quite good tolerated. And in the third side, it needs to be um, com a combination possible with bendamustine. That's not so easy. You have to find three things, an effective drug, a tolerated drug, and a drug which can be combined with bendamustine and that there is no antagonistic increased toxicity. So there are still some attempts. Bortezomib was done. It was not so successful. There was a phase two study, but it appears that it was not better than BR alone. A typical classical old chemo like doxorubicin cannot be added. We have found in, in Italy that RSC, cytarabine, can be added to bendamustine rituximab. But for low-grade lymphoma, I think that approach is too aggressive. This may be a good treatment for mantle cell lymphoma, a more aggressive disease. So I have no perfect idea how to do it. The maintenance question will play a role, for sure, if that is going to improve the outcome of BR. And of course, there may be some other ideas in the future. I have some personal ideas, um, but you know, in investigator-initiated trials, to organize it, it's sometimes more complicated than when you just follow an idea of a pharmaceutical company. True. So I have my ideas, but then you need to organize it, to organize, yes, and to find enough money to do such a study. In the tremendous changes that have been seen in the 10 years since you initiated this trial originally, and especially in the last three or four years, particularly in, in this area, are you optimistic? that the next three years, the next few years, we're going to find some definitely better combinations, drugs? Um, no, I'm not so optimistic. I know that the relevance trial is on the way, and that is R-square Revlimid plus Rituximab against R-chemo. Mm -hmm. That would be the one study who could make a difference. Then there was a gallium trial with a new antibody Obinutuzumab against rituximab. This did not address the question of the good chemo backbone. It was up to doctor's choice. So there was a result a little bit better with a new antibody. If that really translates into a new standard will be seen in the future. There will be many um, controversial discussions about that and we will see what the future is. And then on the horizon are there some more studies which already have recruited full number of patients to my knowledge, they are no. But BR is going to be around for a while, you would think. I would think so, yes, because, I mean, um, time to next treatment with such a long control of the disease with a PFS of um, f nearly five years with an overall survival of 70 years right. now is a hurdle for the new combinations. Well, thank you, Dr. Rimmel. I really appreciate your time. And there's been a lot happening here at ASCO, so please look around for the coverage in the book as well as online for Ash Clinical News. I'm Rick McGuire.